surreal interview today with legendary filmmaker Penelope Spheris. She's directed all the decline of Western civilization movies, along with Suburbia plus Wayne's World and some other really cool, interesting projects. And she's got great stories about rock music, Hollywood, filmmaking, and more. Definitely one of my favorite interviews so far this year. Enjoy. Anyway, um, I'm here. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I, I appreciate it. Uh, big fan. And uh, I just watched, I've, I watched some of your movies and I just watched the third Western uh, Decline of Civilization because I heard you talk about how that was one of your most, your best works of film, basically. And I, I agree. I just watched it today. I was like, wow, this is really good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for watching it. It is my favorite film I've done. Yeah, it's interesting because although the first two are more focused on music, this kind of has a music on it, but it's really more just about these kids who... Some of them are in bands, but it looked like most of them were just kind of punk fans more so, wouldn't you say? Yeah, once I started um, shooting the film, I realized it was more about uh, homeless gutter punks than it was about the music, because the music hadn't really changed or evolved that much. So, I don't know, I think a good documentary will take you down the road that it wants to, you know, I mean, like, you're not in charge, the <laughs> the subject matter is, you know. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's, it's interesting, because that movie seems so much more relevant today, even because the homeless po uh, population has just grown so much. And so obviously, things have changed since this movie was filmed. But uh, just to have a to capture that uh, point in time. I mean, they didn't have the fentanyl and stuff back then. I mean, they still had drugs and alcohol, but yeah, I don't know what it is. I thought about that lately. That um, somehow I, I I saw into the future. You know, even even when I did um, Suburbia in '83, you know, that was about squatter punks. You know, and then when uh decline when i did decline three it was as if all those kids had watched suburbia and then they lived that lifestyle you know yeah uh, it's it's, it's, <clears throat> it's interesting the, the squatting thing because now you've got the homeless encampments but the squatting thing was actually like really smart and that was one thing that really stood out in this uh third movie was just how smart these kids were and i think you even say to one of them um you know it seems like you got a good heart like when I see those kids, I know on the outside, they, you know, they look punk, they got spiked hair and they, they kind of appear wild and they're doing crazy stuff. But like when you interview them on camera, like you start talking to them, you can tell that they're just kids. They're just like normal, uh, yeah. smart and pretty good hearted kids. And they just went through, you know, some rough things in their life that you obviously highlight in the film. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, one reason why I relate to them because I had a, a a difficult upbringing, not as bad as theirs, but uh, most of them, you know. But it, um, I don't know. They're for, right now, like my friends are my punk friends. I don't really have Hollywood friends because um, basically all those people suck. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I shouldn't make generalizations. And you seem like such a nice guy. I don't mean to be bad rapping people with such a nice person talking to me. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's nice of you to say that. Five minutes. You must ago. have had an easy childhood. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, I mean, I think it was easy in terms of like, we weren't poor. Like there was always like food on the table and stuff. But like, I wasn't like a popular or well-liked kid growing. I mean, I was like, uh, I was really skinny. And so I was like always bullied for that kind of just, people kind of just pushed me around. And so no, it took a no, long time. Fat, you mean the fat kids pushed you around? Just every kid, any kid that was bigger than me, which was like every kid. So, no. I mean, it's nothing like what, what you went through, which was interesting. To, you kind of have an interesting perspective on it, cause, though, because I heard you say something about how, um, you know, moving around a lot and, and what you went through, it prepared you for adulthood. Because adulthood, you get knocked around a lot and you can't predict things. And yeah. childhood kind of prepared you for that. It was kind of an interesting perspective on that. Yeah, I got I went because uh, I my father owned a carnival and my mom 
she worked on the carnival and we traveled, you know, every week um, so that we would be in a different location on the weekends and be able to take all the money from the people out in the country. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that's what they thought, though. They thought all the carnival people were um, there to rip them off, you know. But, no, they provided entertainment. Who didn't love a carnival or fair? Exactly. You know, my dad had me shooting people out of cannons and he used to hang me over the, well, I shouldn't talk about this because I'm writing a book. I'm actually making a movie about a move, it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With your, is this but, with your daughter too? Is she going to help you? Well, she was, and then she crapped out. So uh, now I'm just kind of doing it with me and this editor that I met. And um, I don't know, you know, my daughter, Anna Fox, is the most lovely person in the whole wide world. And we're the best fr of friends. But, you know, either you're uh, into the movies and directing or you're not, you know, and she's just not, you know. So, yeah. That's interesting. So you're still into it because you don't have to to work right you've made enough from the other films that you could retire but you still love it for the art of it right well chuck i must say i don't really give a flying f about making movies anymore uh and when i say that i mean for the studios or some yeah. independent movie that somebody else wrote but i will finish this movie on the carnival that i started uh and I have declined four in that computer over there. And that's about it. I don't I don't like movies anymore. The ones, the new ones that, that they're making, you know, they don't interest me. Uh, I don't ever find it. I never even look at TV anymore because, you know, everybody's like, oh, my God, you got yellow jackets and Yellowstone and yellow everything. I, don't, I can't even <laughs> watch this shit, you know? Really? Mm -mm. No I feel way. like because yeah, we're living in the golden age of TV. There's so many TV shows and series out there. Well, I don't know. To me, golden age, and I guess I'm just an old fart right now, but uh, was like, you know, the comedy, like I Love Lucy and all those Mary Tyler Moore shows and that sort of thing, you know, but that was my time back then growing up. And I think I learned a lot about comedy, at least enough to do Wayne's World. Um back then but i could give a crap right now about watching tv yeah it is interesting how there doesn't seem to um, have been any major big co comedies that i can think of. i mean there's a lot of these science fiction or uh like comic book movies and there's a lot of big kids movies and some action movies but i'm trying to think of the last like really funny like raunchy comedy I, or even just like a wayne's world like a pg-13 style comedy i can't think of that many in the last 10 years yeah, well, that's because I haven't been working in the last 10 years, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I think you may be right about Hollywood maybe a little bit clueless on some of this stuff. Like, I feel like somebody needs to come along and shake things up and make like a, a like an old school, like 80s or 90s kind of like raunchy comedy. I think You know I mean, what is the internet kind of scrambled everybody's sense of humor, if you ask me. You know, people are laughing at stuff that I personally don't think is funny and so you know how could i make a funny movie if everybody else thinks other stuff is funny you know i mean it, i don't know the, the internet is just um throwing a wrench into things in a way you know like do you think uh stuff is too mean-spirited or just too goofy or i have to be honest with you a lot of it i just don't get you know mm -hmm. and and also yeah the mean-spirited stuff I, uh, boy people can be so mean uh and it's terrible you know but no i'm i'm um i just i don't watch movies i don't uh watch tv i don't listen to the radio but i guess i'd better listen to your podcast <laughs> uh, i just watched a little bit of your d snyder thing i didn't know you also had video that you put up on um you know, YouTube, but I guess I could have done that, put some makeup on and shit, you know? <laughs> hey, whatever works. I can I put a nice picture of you up. Uh, uh, the last one I saw was like, you had a really good picture, like this black and white. I was like, wow, that's a really cool picture. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. That's, I think that's like your profile picture on Wikipedia or whatever, but um, yeah. So it's just, so, that's so interesting. So you've kind of just gotten burned out on the film business basically. 
Well, I mean, you know, it's I don't mean to be cliche here, but been there, did that, you know, done it, over with. I just I feel like I don't I build houses. If I feel a creative urge, mm. I'll go redesign a landscape on a hillside behind a house I built. You know, I, I build houses now and I feel that's my creative out. Uh, let right now building houses yeah and are you are you doing it to help people this is like habitat for humanity kind of thing well if somebody wants to move into this empty guest house i have right here i'd be sure yeah i got a foster kid that wants to live there so uh no i i don't do habitat for humanity i actually build a house for myself and my boyfriend to live in and i rebuilt about three other houses um and I rent them out so I don't have to take shit off of uh, Hollywood movie executives anymore. I can just uh, get some rent money, you know? Yeah. It sounds like you took a, it's so interesting to hear. I, I listened to a few interviews and to listen to all the people that all the shit you had to deal with. I was like, damn, like, cause I think a lot of people just kind of tell me the good stuff and you are, you don't hold back. Like you're, you're telling people like, Oh, this person talked, you know, they were mean to me. This person was mean. this person. I'm yeah. like, wow, this is really interesting. I mean, you talk about the good stuff too, obviously, but. Well, there's this kind of code in Hollywood where I don't know what, where it came from. Probably the thirties or forties or something where you're not supposed to say anything bad about the industry or anybody in this in, in the industry. You're just never supposed to say anything bad. Well, f that because if something bad happened, why can't you say it? You know, and I mean everybody blows it up and oh makes a big deal out of me and Mike Myers having a little fight. It wasn't a big deal, but um. You know, um, yeah, I tell the truth. What can I tell you? Yeah, that was interesting. The Mike Myers. I think that's why I reached out because I saw that article and I was like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And then I was like, oh, maybe she'll do my podcast. And thankfully you did. Um, but yeah, so some of the other things like the the, the thing you had with Lauren Michaels, but t tell me about um, before you guys start, like you were friends with him before he became like the SNL powerhouse because yeah. I can't picture him other than being like, you know, the power suit, you know, wearing guy that he is today. Like, so was there a time where he was just wearing like jeans and t-shirts and just like a regular guy? Oh, hell yeah. I'm back in the uh, early seventies is when I met Lauren and he was good friends. Uh, we had friends in common, Gary Weiss and um, John Head, uh, Edie Baskin of Baskin and Robbins, you know, they all worked on Saturday Night Live when it, when it came to fruition, but yeah, I, I knew Lauren um, when he was sitting, he sat in my uh, dining room uh, and I was making him an omelet. He still says I make the best omelets, by the way. And um, he was reading the morning newspaper on Sunday and he said, you know, I think I'm going to go start a show in New York and maybe it should even be live and who knows, Saturday night, whatever. So yeah, I knew him way back then. And he asked me to go to New York to work on SNL, but Anna, my daughter was just uh, three years old at that time. And I didn't want to leave LA uh, and just pull her out, you know? So I stayed here. He goes, well, will you help me if I need anything in LA? And I said, of course I will. And, um, uh, I'll do anything for a weekly salary, you know? So he calls me and said, I found this really funny guy. He he he, he doesn't want to be a player on the show, but he, he wants to make little movies and you know how to make movies. So will you teach him? And I said, okay. And it was Albert Brooks. So I worked producing on the show. Yeah. In the early days. Yeah. But they would never let me make movies because guess what? Chicks don't know how to make movies. Ha ha. Hmm. Yeah, that is so so weird. Times have changed quite a bit now. I feel like they're promoting that more. They want to get more female directors and such. Yeah, just when I quit. It's <laughs> <laughs> my luck, right? Yeah. So that's crazy though. So you were um before you made the you wanted to make the, the first Western um so decline of civilization movie and your friends were like laughed at you. And th these were like this was like Billy Crystal and people like they were like yeah. uh, Jim Brooks was a friend back then and uh, Rob Reiner and uh, Penny Marshall, because they all knew Albert and I met them all through Albert. They were all like Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills brats. And 
I'm I'm like from you know Orange County Trailer Park, and I didn't know what the hell was going on in uh, in Hollywood. But I learned a lot about Hollywood from those people. And yeah, when they when I told them I was going to go make a movie about punk rock, they made fun of me, just like they made fun of you when you were a skinny kid. And they yeah. laughed at me. <laughs> you were your friends, so didn't did they, did they they make fun of you? And then they said, "Okay, we're you know we're just kind of kidding around. Actually, we really support you." Or they just never. No. No, they didn't say we support you. Uh uh-uh. uh. They, they said, made fun because you're going to do it anyway. Because punk rock back then was so misunderstood, you know? It's like it, people were afraid of punk rock in uh, 1977, you know? And you couldn't even talk to all the straight, you know, movie community about punk rock because they would laugh at you and go, that's a bunch of bullshit, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Do you, I mean, it seems like you had the last laugh because we're still talking about that movie. And I think the one you turned down was uh, Private Benjamin, which I think yeah. that probably is a good movie, too. But I feel like it's not I, I'd be more proud of the the, the, the punk movie than Private Benjamin. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Goldie. No, um, the thing is, I just had such a, um, a, a urge to make a movie about this punk movement because it just seemed important you know and if if my straight hollywood friends didn't get, believe me they weren't straight they were all doing drugs but whatever uh um but you know if, if they didn't get it well too bad i just had to keep going and what i believed in you know yeah that's really interesting because you've you've you turned down so many big movies over the, I just kept hearing all these things, interviews where you talked about, yeah, I, I could have directed this as Spinal Tap, but I didn't want to make fun of heavy metal. You turned down Legally Blonde. I know. I, 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 some, of my, some of them I kicked myself in the ass for because not Legally Blonde necessarily, but you know, well, and I turned down like a shitload of money for, um, I think it was $3 million I got offered as a salary to do George of the Jungle, you know? Right. And, uh, God, God bless uh, Brandon Frazier for getting an Oscar lately or whatever the hell it was he won. But, um, you know, it, it's just I, I, I couldn't do it. You know, I, I, I didn't want to make all those uh, comedies I made uh, in the 90s. I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't get the movies I wrote uh, financed. So, see, once I did Wayne's World, I was in a pigeonhole. It was like. Penelope Spears, yeah, she can make us a lot of money by doing a goofball comedy, so we'll offer her. And so I took the money finally because I can't get my own movies made, you know? I told my daughter, I told my daughter, Anna, keep them because when I die, they'll be worth a lot of money. The scripts (laughs) you have that you, uh, I mean, you still have the scripts that you couldn't get made? Yeah, man, they're right behind me in that, in that, oh, you can't see me, but, but right back over there. In the corner, there's a big file cabinet with a shitload of scripts in it, you know, that I could never get made. And you don't have any interest to try to make them self-finance them now. What's the point? You know, I mean, <laughs> I I'd mean, be curious to see what you'd come up with. I don't. I mean, I'd be curious. To see the next... so, you only live so long. I got a few years left, I guess. I don't know. But what am I going to do with that time? You know, go uh, beg somebody for $3 million to make a movie that I wrote 20 years ago. And, you know, no, I told her, just save it, man, because, you know, let let her and her kids, um, you know, sell them in. And, uh, but I got to die first. I'm, I'm not going to let them do it while I'm still alive. I'll give yeah. you one. No. <laughs> What's that? And I'll give you one. Yeah, that would be, I would, I mean, I'd be curious just to at least read it. That sounds interesting. I mean, you've made, so, so you've, you've had this eclectic uh, career, but it's not, you said like suburbia was, that was the movie that you wish you would have made more movies like that. Like that exactly. was kind of, yeah. Yeah. What you wanted. But they wouldn't let me, you know, they wouldn't let me do it. Uh, when yeah, I said, that's so stupid. Cause it seems like if with the hit Wayne's world, you should be able to do whatever you want. Thank you. <laughs> and I walked into John Goldwyn's office when he was going to do leap of faith and i said look i just made the studio 180 whatever million dollars with wayne's world so can i please direct direct uh leap of faith with uh steve martin because i can make that movie really well 
and I didn't get the gig, you know? And that's Hollywood. There are no friends, there is no loyalty, and um, you can't expect to be paid back for doing good. So fuck them all. <laughs> Yeah, I like that movie, Leave a Face. It's kind of like uh, the Righteous Gemstones. I, I I know you don't watch new TV, but you might actually like that show. It's on HBO. It's pretty good. It's about it's a similar kind of thing about this. I ain't watching this- none of that shit, man. <laughs> and you know what else? I never saw a Leap of Faith because I figured if they don't want to give me the job, they can, you know, I ain't going to pay 20 bucks for a ticket. Fuck yeah. Up. Why? Did they give you a reason why they didn't? Um... I no, but I mean, I've <laughs> I've been shut down so many times. I don't even need a reason anymore. You know, it's just like I don't know why. I don't know why. Oh. It sucks. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the movies that you did do that, that I, I don't hear you talk about a lot in the interviews, but I love, I think it's underrated, Black Sheep. I love that movie. I'm a huge Chris Farley fan. And I thought that one was on par with Tommy Boy. I love both those movies. Um, but talk about that. I know that there were some problems with the script. They rushed to get the script. They told the script writer that you got to finish this by this date. And he had to, he wrote like 45 pages over the weekend or something, but. <laughs> that would account for the speed they were using. No, is, that what, is that how he did that? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I don't know if anybody was using speed, but there was a lot of drippy noses around. No. Um, Here's the thing. Yeah, Black Sheep. I, I didn't really want to do another um, another comedy, you know, uh, but Sherry Lansing called me up and said, hey, uh, we don't have a script, but would you do this movie with Chris Farley? And I said, I love Chris Farley. I would love to do a movie with him, but I really need to kind of see the script, you know, lady. And uh, we don't have a script. So they had to do it because because Chris had an obligation to do another movie after um, Tommy Boy contractually over at Paramount. And unless uh, the studio exercised their option by nine o'clock on Monday morning, he was going to go do Cable Guy. He really wanted to do Cable Guy. Yeah. And um, so uh, they were on the phone at four o'clock in the afternoon with me going... Chris isn't going to do anything with us until we tell them who the director is. And I, I said, well, I, you don't have a script. What am I going to do? And, uh, you know, they said, well, we'll give you two and a half million dollars. And I'm like, for myself? Yeah. Oh. And I just sat there silent. She got Goldwyn on the phone. And then he goes, okay, um, Penelope, 275. And I, <laughs> I said, for my salary, 275. Yeah. So anyway, I, I sold out. What can I tell you, man? I'm an old fucking punk rocker and I sold out because I can't get my own movies made. What am I going to do? Oh, okay. you guys shoved the money and I can't get my movies made. You know, so I took the money, you know. But it was, I like that movie. I mean, what was it like working with Chris Farley? Because I, I heard you say he did, did all of his own stunts. Was he also really funny, like off camera? Because that's what I've seen. No. He's not. Okay. In my opinion, no. Really? So he wasn't joking around with Spade and stuff like that, like off the camera? Uh-uh. No. Did they, did he would they say have... things like, he Chris would say things like, um, do you think that, actually, I think Chris was depressed, if you ask me, you know, and, and uh, in retrospect, and I've never said that publicly before, but, uh, you know, he would say things to me like, um, do you think people would still like me if I wasn't fat? And I'm like, of course they would. You're funny. You know, you're a great actor. You're, you're charming. You're lovable. They would, they would love you no matter what. And he goes, no, no, they only like me because I'm fat, you know? And that's kind of sad, you know? Oh my God. That's heartbreaking. Wow. That's, oh, that's so terrible to hear that. I remember when I was a kid, I was a big John Candy fan. And right. Candy died really early. And I didn't, I was like asking my dad, I was like, I don't understand what, how did he die so young? And my dad said that kid. a lot of times that people are bigger like that, that they're laughing on the outside, but crying on the inside. And I think it's uh-huh. another example of that. It sounds like your dad is correct. I was with the morning I found out that John Candy passed away. I was driving to work on the little rascals and Daryl Hannah was working that day. And 
I, I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just devastated. It's really hard for me to even work. She goes, what's the matter? I said, well, John Candy died. And she blew it, man. She went into downhill spiral spin out. And uh, I didn't know it, but she was working on a script with him at the time very closely. I, I had no idea. But yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's anyway. It seems like there's a lot of that in Hollywood where they just don't talk about some of the bad, or at least they didn't. I feel like maybe things are hopefully changing now, but a lot of that stuff was kind of pushed under the rug. Like you just didn't know. I didn't know Chris Farley had all these problems until it came out later. Yeah. I, I didn't read his book or anything, but um, yeah. Uh, everybody's got a lot of problems. What can I tell you? You know, everybody. Everybody, you know anybody that's really happy and like perfectly. Some of these people that rent my houses, though, they're they're on this like new age um uh hippie trip. I don't know. <laughs> it's really? Like, yeah, I mean, I keep renting and I found oh, there's a third yoga teacher I've got in one house here. So uh and they all like um they, you know they walk around in white robes and go to mexico and learn how to be a guru and shit you know i, I i'm sorry i just don't get it <laughs> so you don't meditate you've ever tried meditating or anything like that have i ever tried it yeah i yeah. tried it. it doesn't fucking work man <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean i think it's one of those things that the people that are really good at it they practice i mean that's what i was told because i tried to do it and i was like they told me I had monkey mind because I can't I can't focus on relaxing. Oh yeah, hard. monkey mind is a Buddhist phrase, and yeah. and all of us OCD people have that. And I know it's hard to control, and meditating theoretically controls it. But I live right behind one of the houses that I rent, and I watch these idiots walk around in these long white robes and flowers in their hair and shit. You know, it, <laughs> it's like. Give me a break, you know. <laughs> so what calm you don't like TV, uh, you don't want to make movies. So is it just the is does building houses is that like calm you down and center you and kind of like relax you a little bit or give you something? No, I just take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that calmed me down, man. I mean, yeah, I, I no, as I've gotten older, I've gotten less of that manic energy, and I think that manic energy can actually be destructive if you're not able to control it and i didn't mean to speak poorly of meditation because i have great respect for it but um it, it's just people my whole life have told me you really should be meditating penelope you know and um i'm because i'm so hyper and ocd and 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 you know over the over the edge there but um what calms me down hmm, a nap yeah. Well, no, but I mean, maybe that's, you just were able to channel that energy into filmmaking. Cause if you were kind of like a laid back, really calm person, it would be hard to work as hard as you worked on these films. Right. Cause I mean, isn't in the filmmaking industry, like you work really long hours and uh, like hard. Well, you know, business. that's the thing Chuck is that's another reason why I really don't mind that I'm not making movies now, because first of all, uh, the, the hours are just insane anymore and y your your product your movie gets lost in the streaming shuffle and um i mean i drove off the road one time when i was shooting suburbia because i was you know all night long shooting and fell asleep at the wheel with my kid in the back seat you know it's like Huh. And now, unfortunately, everybody wants to be in the movies or making movies or whatever. And so they hire a lot of people that don't know what they're doing, inexperienced people. So there's a lot of different reasons put together why I'm glad I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. Cause, yeah, because you actually spoke highly of film school, where some people say, oh, you don't need that. You say that it really helped you. Yeah, I think, when, is it like Tarantino? He always saying you don't need to go to film school. Well, uh, oh God, that guy. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think film You don't school, like Tarantino? No, I don't. You don't like his films or you don't like him as a person or both? Both. Well, really? no, actually, I like Kill Bill. Okay. Yeah. I know too much. Okay. 
I, I know too much, but I'm not going to sit here and bad rap Tarantino because he's probably got a bigger, badder lawyer than me. Hmm. I'm sure he does. <laughs> it's interesting that he's re retiring. He's only going to do one more film. It's like, yeah, right. How many times did Ozzy Osbourne retire? <laughs> uh, the true. end of the end. True, about, true, uh, true. Retirement sucks tour. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about working with him because you did that movie. Obviously, it was never released. We sold our soul for rock and roll. But I mean, did you work closely with him, or was it more the other bands on Ozfest? No, I I was friends with Sharon and Ozzy for probably you know twenty years before I did. We sold our souls for rock and roll, so I've known them forever. And um, yeah, I forgot what you asked me. What? Oh, just what it was like. I mean, obviously you interviewed him and declined too, but um, yeah. I didn't know what it was like to work with. Like Sharon like scares me a little bit. Like she's, she seems like somebody you don't want to fuck with from the stories I've heard. Like she's probably really nice if you're nice. Okay, so for the rest of the podcast, we're going to have you say that 100 times. <laughs> anyway. Um, Isn't that good advice though? I mean, if you were friends, you were able to be friends with her for 20 years. You I told Sharon, I told Sharon, well, after we worked together, it's a whole different thing. But I told Sharon, I said, before I worked with you on Sold Our Souls for Rock and Roll, before that, I always thought I was the most badass chick in the world. Okay, that's what I thought. Swear to God, badass rock and roll chick in the whole world. But then after working with her, I said, I give you the title. <laughs> <laughs> that bitch is badass, man. <laughs> no, yeah. she's brutal. She's brutal. You can watch your head roll with your feet, man. That's a, is that the secret to her success is just being so like, like she's a good businesswoman. I feel like she knows how to get things done. Um, the secret to her success. Now there's a phrase. And what success are we talking about? Well, I mean, just, I mean, don't, isn't she part of the reason she was that really Ozzy successful was to... on that show? She did when she and Ozfest and the way that she, Ozzy, well, I know I mean, she's, she's got to be part of the reason. No, that she's a Ozzy... badass businesswoman. I learned a lot from Sharon. I'll tell you the thing I learned from Sharon that was the most valuable to me. And that is how to use time to fuck people's head around. I know. That's a so, weird concept. Huh? How? Or just don't say anything to them and it really fucks their head around. Okay. I learned a lot from Sharon about timing and um, what to say when, you know. She's, she's brilliant. She's brilliant. And she's mean as hell. Okay. Yeah. And thank God she gave us, uh, 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 you know, a lifetime of Ozzy music and Black Sabbath. Um, for that, I thank her greatly. For not releasing my film, uh, long story, but maybe someday after I'm dead, uh, it'll be seen. Yeah, it just seems like such a dumb oh, reason. That they I'm sorry. Get... I just remembered. Uh, she agreed lately that we could show the film at the uh, Motion Picture Academy Museum on August the 18th. So, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. You're in Chicago. Was that right? No. Where are you? I'm Arizona. In, I'm in Arizona, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, we should get you a ticket out here. But this is going to be a bitch and film screening. I'm telling you. Oh, anyways. So how did they get the rights? Because wasn't the thing that they didn't have the rights? To we'll go there, dude. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Just gotcha. let us show the film. <laughs> All right. That that is true punk rock saying, fuck it, we're gonna do it anyways. Well, she I'm just glad Sharon finally agreed to show it, you know. Yeah. It's been 20 years. Yeah, that's gotta be fascinating to see that. That would be really interesting for sure. It is. It's you know, as as the decline is a historical document. Um we sold ourselves for rock and roll is a historical heavy metal document now. And um, did I tell you uh, decline was inducted into the library of Congress national uh, film registry recently? Did I, tell I you saw that? that? Yeah, I saw that. I think it's, I think I saw an article or something about it, but yeah, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah. And so I don't know these films about music that I've done are getting some kind of respect and, you know, it'd be cool if um, 
soul of our souls would be able to be seen at some point, you know. What bands are, can you say what bands are in it? I guess oh, yeah. it was in a, cause I Oz remember you got, you got Black Sabbath headlining, you got Zombie, Rob Zombie, you got Slayer, Primus, Fear Factory, uh, Slipknot, uh, System of a Down, Static X, um, you got a great um, thing with uh, Buckethead guitar player. You know Buckethead? Yeah, yeah. He was in Guns N' Roses for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. And I forgot one, but um, yeah, those bands. That sounds amazing. So you do interviews with them and uh, show a uh, yeah. black footage? I took, I took Slayer out to um, um, Alcatraz when we when they played San Francisco. Yeah, and then I interviewed him at Alcatraz. Yeah. <laughs> That There's all kinds be... of fun stuff in that movie. Yeah. Uh, but, so was it your idea to interview him in Alcatraz? Because I know in part two, a lot of the interviews, like Paul Stanley's like, oh, you got to interview me here with all these playmates or like a lot of them right. did their own interviews. And you just went, OK, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Yeah, I can't remember if I, I'm pretty we were in San Francisco. I mean, what are you going to do? Stand on a hill? You know, it's like. Uh, we went, I, I, I thought of going to Alcatraz and the band liked the idea because they wanted to visit there and they were like little kids in the jail cells. It was hilarious. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I did the Alcatraz tour at night because I thought they said it might be Ooh, haunted scary. or something. Yeah. Was really <laughs> you did a movie about, um, speaking of supernatural, because you did a movie, I've never heard anyone ask you about this. You did a movie about UFO abductions. I haven't seen it. Well, what was your take after doing that movie? Do you think it was all bullshit? Well, it was actually a part of a Paramount TV series called um, UFO Abductions. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I actually uh, did a, a huge amount of research uh, about that subject and realized while doing the research that it's possible, and I still think it's possible, that something like that happened to me because I was, when I got out of um, high school, I, I wanted to go, me and my best friend wanted to go to New Orleans. And on the way back, I was driving her car and over the roof of her car, in the middle of the desert, there were these four blue, uh, the size of basketballs, four blue balls above the car, following the car. I swear to God, I looked up and I'm like, did I just go under an underpass or what? And then the next thing I remember, she was driving the car and I was waking up in the passenger seat. So I'm pretty sure we both got abducted. Wow. <laughs> I, I know when I interviewed all these people for the, for the TV show, they were talking about these balls that would follow them around you know i don't know if you've ever heard that before they're blue they're bright blue glowing and yeah they follow you i know i sound like a nut right now. no i had a guy on my show who uh specializes in this stuff and i mean it's there's so many eyewitness accounts i read his book and i talked to him and he's talked to a lot of these people and it's, it's really interesting i don't know what to believe but i i don't I think it's all bullshit either i mean there's something going on i think there's something going on in the news right now there's something in vegas a sighting i, I don't know i mean oh really yeah there's like i'll food. tell you when we uh, one of the, the most fun stories is when we were shooting we were shooting in griffith park and mm -hmm. you know we had this uh fake um uh alien ship that had crashed into the side of a mountain and we were all out there middle of the day okay we're shooting this thing and some guy on a horse, because you can rent a horse up there in Griffith Park in L.A. here. And some guy um, comes by and he's totally naked on the horse. And he's no, he had a hat, cowboy hat. <laughs> OK. And some cowboy boots on. And he he uh, kind of rode through the scene where we were shooting and. uh I said, what's up, man? And, and he's like, oh, just looking for somebody to go for a ride with. <laughs> I, I, I always remember that from when I was shooting up there. You must have a ton of stories like that with all these, like, interviewing all these punk rockers and stuff. And Yeah. Um, That's I, mean, why I, I wrote a book. I wrote a book, but during the COVID time, you know, so maybe you had D. Snyder on twice right so yeah wow maybe you when i get my book done see my problem chuck 
is I can't figure out the title and I can't go to a publisher and say, hey, I got a book, but I don't know what the fuck the title is, you know? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I just have to um, figure out the title. I wrote it with a young man in New York that writes for RogerEbert.com and sometimes New York Times. His name is Simon Abrams. And Simon and I worked on the book for two years. Yeah. And I told oh. all these stories, even about the naked cowboy, dude. Mm -hmm. that's okay i would definitely want to read that or i, I like listening <laughs> to books on audio but yeah i love that that sounds amazing i've heard a lot of interviews and you always tell different stories i'm like oh wow, i never heard that one i never like today i heard one with uh were you talking about you almost uh directed rockstar with mark Wahlberg, and then he, he oh was, yeah that guy's an asshole <laughs> yeah. oh i heard you say that that he showed up to lunch and he had already eaten because he didn't yeah, he was he being a dick Wahlberg? because he didn't want okay. to direct yeah it. I was out on the Ozfest movie actually, and and um, so Warner Brothers wanted him to come out and meet me because uh, I would be such a great director for the movie Rockstar. Well, stupid premise in the first place for the script, if you ask me. But whatever. Anyway, so he came out there to to Ozfest, and we went and sat in my trailer and had a talk, and and that's a whole nother story. But then he said, then Warner Brothers says, go have lunch with her. Oh, and so we go up to this um, Italian restaurant on Sunset Boulevard and he want me to at two or two thirty, something like that. And I'm like, that's a late lunch. Well, fucker already ate. He sat there. He had already eaten. He's picking his teeth and smoking a cigarette. And he goes, would you like something? And I'm like, OK, see, that's what happens in Hollywood. If a star has the power to turn down a director, they invite him to lunch. Hmm. And then they eat first and don't give them any lunch. Fuck him. I don't want his lunch. You know what I'm saying? That's like a power move, but like a, a dick power move. Like total dick power move, man. I never liked that guy. And then he bought the fucking restaurant and called it Wahlburgers. Oh, oh, that's the one he bought that turned it into. Yeah, it used to be some I forgot, but it was a good Italian restaurant. And he went and wrecked it with his fucking name. <laughs> I heard you say too that you, uh, when you're working on Senseless, you had to deal with the Weinstein's, and you you said oh. they put all this like sh like the worthless input is what you I think the word you used. What did I say? I think the term used with worthless input to try yeah, right. to, to change things, and you're like, dude, what are you? Why are you changing this? Like you're making it more complicated than it needs to be. Well, they, you know, <laughs> there's an old joke. Um, producer and a writer are walking through the desert and they're th so thirsty and they come upon this stream and the writer bends down and drinks some water and the producer takes a whiz in the stream. And the writer said, what are you doing, man? And the producer says, I'm making it better. And that's what I went through with the Weinsteins. It's like they kept rewriting stuff, give me new pages, and it was it wasn't good, you know, in my but, opinion. But Harvey never tried to like get a massage from you or anything crazy like that. Um no, I was too old and ugly. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, he liked them young actress bitches. You know, it's not, I wasn't his type, but uh, thank God. Yeah, yeah seriously. That's so but, crazy. Uh, you know, uh, the mental abuse was pretty gnarly. That is fucked up when people, yeah, when they do the psychological head games. I never, it's so messed up. And it, you, yeah, you can't claim it as, as bad as the, sometimes I'm just like, okay, I would rather have somebody punch me in the face than deal with a psychological head game. Oh yeah, for sure. I oh, I want to ask you about this. I read this. I, I never heard you talk about this, but when that movie you made the uh, 1985, the boys next door, mm -hmm. originally Crispin Glover auditioned for the part, but did you, it was, you said that his performance was too psychotic. Explain that to me. Cause he's, he's a really fascinating person to me. I believe he is an extremely fascinating person, extremely talented um, actor, a little bit kind of maybe borderline spectrum. I don't know. He's odd, you know, but odd in a good way. I like unusual people like that. Um, 
And uh, you know more about me than I do because I forgot he auditioned. I, now I remember why we were driving around the car together one day. Yeah, because oh, he, okay. he had a dish, he had to audition for Boys Next Door. And then that's the part that John Cryer got. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. So it was just a little but it was it just wasn't right for that part. What's that? He wasn't right for that part. The part of Bo, I think it was. Uh, right the part of Bo but it, it, it really comes down again to Sandy Howard was the producer and he really had the last say about who was going to be cast and uh he wanted to cast uh Charlie and Charlie was just breaking out at that point you know yeah, yeah. pain in the oh. ass though <laughs> well you cast it's kind of interesting because you you had Flea has been in um he was in decline three and uh, but you also cast him as an actor in suburbia, right? Was that his one of his first roles? And because I don't know if people know, I mean, he obviously is the bass player for Red Hot Chili Peppers, but he's also an actor. Like he's been in, in a lot of movies as an actor. I know. And and he thanks me to this day because I saw his cute little face with that split in his teeth and those blue eyes. And I said, This is a star. And I hadn't even heard him play bass yet. You know, I mean, he's the most awesome bass player. He goes all around the world and he says, wherever he goes, people call suburbia the punk rock Bible. <laughs> wow, that's quite a compliment. Yeah, I hope I didn't piss off any Christians. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Yeah, because that's that's one of the things in, in three they talk about. There's a lot of that kind of talk about. Um, just like, you know, rebelling against the establishment and stuff. And there's, it's interesting because there was a lot of hate to the cops, but the cop you interviewed was like, he seemed like a really level-headed, nice guy. Like I, I was, was he the only one that would say yes to do the interview? Yeah. Plus we paid him. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he, he was, uh, I always like to have the, you know, the offset, you know, to the, to the concept. So we have the what's her name? It sounds like Pinocchio in uh, in Decline Two, uh, Doreen Pinocchio, whatever her name was, and she's talking about all the heavy metal signs you can do with one hand. Do you remember that one? Six. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. She's. I always like to have the person that you know that represents the PMRC. You know, what I mean, it's like so. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it's not like he was the 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 bad. The cop wasn't really the bad guy, though. I mean. You kind of you kind of just feel for those kids though. It's like, and then when they tell the stories, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but to tell the stories about their family life and then and dealing with the cops, you're just like, wow, like why can't people be nicer to each other? Do you think that's part of the issue with with homeless? Because now it's such a big issue. How do like how do we deal with it? Is there do you do you have any solutions or ideas? Yeah, I went to I was invited to go down to some architectural school, very sophisticated place here in LA and that was a couple of years ago and there weren't as many homeless, but now it's just uh, through the, <laughs> excuse the expression, through the roof. But, um, you know, the, the, I don't think there is an answer right now. And I'm certainly not the one to give it. Uh, but if you put a gun to my head, and I wish you would, <laughs> I, <laughs> I would say, the answer to the homeless problem is to get the mentally ill people some help, okay? I know a lot about schizophrenia. I've been with my boyfriend 26 years. He's, he's schizophrenic. I've done a lot of research on it. I understand it very, very well. He's a genius on the one hand, like John Nash in A Brilliant Mind. Mm. You remember that one? Yeah. A beautiful Mind. I don't know. Beautiful Mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's like that. I understand. He was homeless. My boyfriend was homeless for 10 years before I met him. And so I understand the mentality from firsthand. And I do believe that if any kind of solution is at hand, it would be through governmental help with um, with mental illness. Um, and not that everybody that's out there is mentally ill, you know. Um, it seems like I it's would, either mentally a uh, mental illness or drugs or a combination of both usually well the drugs often causes mental illness but um uh or do also, they take the drugs because they have mental illness and they don't know how else to cope exactly right yeah 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 and, and it's sad you know because it's it is an, it's it's an illness and so to 
punish these people. I mean, I have a person that used to work over at Fox, and they're like vigilantes in her neighborhood. She, um, they all get their guns out and they go down by the LA River and they show the guns and flash it so that they could get the homeless people out of the riverbed. Who gives a shit? They're in the fucking riverbed. You know what I mean? It's not really a solution. That doesn't, how does it, that's what they're doing in Seattle. I'm from Seattle right now and they're, um, they have a huge problem there. And yeah. now they're trying to do this cleanup to get all these, move all these homeless people because the baseball, the all-star game is going to be in Seattle, but they're not really solving. They're just trying to move them out of the, that doesn't really solve the problem in my opinion. Whoa, that makes, I could go off right now, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the solution is, except, you know, during the Reagan era, there was a big cutback in the um, laws and the, um, financial provisions for uh help for the mentally ill i mean i used to always uh, find go to locations that were uh, mental hospitals that were shut down that you could go and rent to make a movie because they kicked out all of the mentally ill people and that was back in the 80s okay so all this time these people have had you know no help and and yeah, we created this. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Did you ever do a follow up with the kids in part three? Like, because you, you're so interesting at the end, you're like asking them, like, what are your goals? And so many of them just said, like, oh, I'll be dead in five or 10 years. Like, I know there's a follow up at the end. I don't want to spoil it. But for the rest of them, did you did you ever follow up or find out what happened to them? Well, I'm still friend. If I have any friends, it's the people from Decline Three. Yeah. And by the way, I'll send you a Decline 3 t-shirt. It's got a great picture of Heather on it. She's the woman on uh, the boulevard there uh, spanging in front of the Chinese theater. She's such a trip. Heather yeah, That's an interesting term, spanging. Like, so it's like you ask people, oh, hey, I'll, you can take a picture with me, but they charge them. That would, yeah. You could do, make a lot of money now doing that because everybody wants a selfie with somebody. Yeah. Except that guy, uh, Michael Jackson, on the subway in New York. Oh, dear. I didn't hear about... Wait, is that... Which one was that? That's a guy that got killed by the... Oh. F yeah. That's terrible. Boy, leave it to me to always bring it down. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh. All wow. right. Well, I think 45 minutes is up. Oh, um, yes. I'm sorry. Cool. We, I'll let you get going. Um, I always end with a charity, so we just want to promote uh, Rescues Rock. I think that was the animal charity that you wanted to promote. Yeah. Kristen Stavola here in... Laurel Canyon devotes 24-7 to rescuing lots and lots of cats and dogs. And I've been up there and I've got a uh, five. Well, I can't tell you how many because mm, I got a lot of dogs and a lot of cats here that I've rescued. And please, Rescues Rock is the charity that I would like to say, please help. Okay, I'll put the uh, link in the show notes along with your website. And uh, I can't wait to see Decline 4. And the uh, movie about your uh, childhood story. That sounds fascinating. So. All right. Well, you're absolutely adorable. I, if I would have had some makeup on, I would have been uh, <laughs> up here on the screen so you could see how adorable I am. Okay. Not. Well, you come back uh, when you want to promote a movie or a book. Yeah. Or whatever you have. We'll do the book. Okay, okay. Keep me posted. Thanks so okay. much. Party on. All right. Party on. <laughs> Bye-bye. Amazing stuff from Penelope Spheris, legendary film director. I look forward to seeing Decline Volume 4 and the movie about her growing up. Both sound fascinating, along with her autobiography. You can support Penelope and the show by liking and sharing this episode on social media. And make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to keep up with future episodes. I appreciate all your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.